Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. We're going to start by taking a look here at the front end of October by examining the total precipitation ranks by climate district. So this is October 1st to October the 19th. We can see where it's been wet, where we've had our tropical systems that have cut through parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley. Also, the system, especially this one this last weekend, that went right here up the East Coast. We've had troughs that have cut into parts of the Great Lakes states, keeping it wet there and also occasionally having them come through parts of the Pacific Northwest, also keeping things wet there. But there's been a broad sector uh, stretching all the way from California through the four corner states in the southern plains and right through the heart of the Corn Belt that's actually been quite dry as we look here at the beginning of October. And here's the reason why. This is what the flow pattern's been doing in terms of our troughs and ridges. We've had troughs that keep developing here in the Gulf of Alaska, just south of the Aleutian Islands. But they're forced to run over the top of almost a persistent high that's been in parts of uh, of the west coast then with this trough that's kind of really set up shop a lot throughout the month of october between the hudson bay and the great lakes states the flow comes right around the base before running off here over another ridge in the north atlantic now that flow pattern if you look at it in terms of wind speed looks something like this and the problem is as the flow comes over that ridge in california there's a big area in through here where we have convergence and convergence in the flow aloft kind of suppresses vertical motion and tends to make things drier so it's been dry uh, from the, the Rocky Mountains through the Central Plains getting over to the Corn Belt, but also where that ridge has been over the West Coast has been quite dry as well. I talk about this at the beginning of the video because we want to see if that pattern is going to change at all, and we're going to get to that in just a few moments. But look at what it did to our soil moisture. I'm going to take you back to October the 1st here and show you the top four inches in terms of soil moisture percentile. You can see that when we go from October 1st here, to the 19th where it has been so much drier because of that flow pattern. A significant part of the United States right now has had substantial drying in the top four inches of the soil as we worked our way through harvest here. Now, the consequences of having some very windy conditions on top of those dry soils has been uh, the fire problems we've had across much of the United States. And while we've been watching large fires coming out of uh, Colorado, also parts of New Mexico, and of course, California, this large ridge that established over the weekend here on Saturday, push, producing high pressure over much of the, the southeast and the Appalachian Mountain area, produced strong winds on its backside that came up out of the south ahead of this frontal boundary that you see right in through here. And those strong winds at times were 30 to 60 miles an hour, and some of the drier conditions in that area after harvest has created field fires like Chad Colby uh, captured here flying around this weekend. You can see the burn scar across these fields here in central Illinois, uh, just evidence of, of, of several of the fires like this that we've seen in this region. Now, since then, we've had a pretty strong cold front that's cut through this section of the United States. You can see it right in through here. The temperatures behind that front dropped off in some places 20 to 25 degrees. And with that cold front coming through here, we did get some precipitation. So uh, focusing in right there in, in the middle of the Corn Belt, we did get some rain that came out of parts of Missouri and Illinois, also in parts of Tennessee, Kentucky. And by the way, if you just go over to the East Coast real quick, you can see the effect of that system over the weekend that started in parts of the Carolinas but ran through Virginia and eventually up into the northeast but on the back side of this now this is just the last 72 hours of total accumulated precip much of what you see in through here actually fell as snow as it did right in through this area as well and to show you that this is our latest analysis of the last 72 hours of of total accumulated snowfall models did a pretty good job picking up on the heavier snows in montana and then stretching them here through parts of south dakota nebraska and iowa and parts of iowa actually over the weekend picked up a half inch to um, some places an inch and a half of snow this is going to be a quarter that over the next uh, week or so I'm going to continue to watch for increased chances of snow and we'll show you those maps in just a few moments here but before I get into that I would like to just show you an animation going through the next week at total accumulated wind gusts so again this map here as it stops next Sunday night just shows us where we're going to be watching for some stronger winds to develop throughout this week and you can see there's a broad swath right in through the midsection of the country here that we're going to be uh, on the lookout for again some stronger winds but as I point this out out. Notice coming off of you know the front range in Colorado down into New Mexico and also here in the Sacramento Valley and in the Pacific Northwest some very strong winds uh, coming through the mountains and some of the problems we're going to be seeing there is a continuation of our threat 
for the wildfires to continue to grow and that smoke to continue to blow from them. So notice right here as we work through the next couple of days, our fires in parts of Colorado and Mexico and back into Utah are continuing to show up. And we're going to watch later this week for the stronger winds to come out of the Sacramento Valley, which could again uh, increase the fire threat throughout California. Okay, from there, the European model over the next week is favoring a few different corridors for precipitation. Snow is what's going to be the main discussion here in this northern corridor, but we're going to see a, a boundary kind of park out in this section of the Midwest, which at times is going to meander both north and south, increasing the chances of precipitation. I'll show you that. We even do have a thunderstorm threat in parts of Iowa later this week before I start talking once again about snow coming through the Midwest. When I compare the European model uh, to the GFS, which is what you can see here, there's pretty good agreement on the northern uh, storm track here and also the boundary that's going to park here, really disrupting harvest uh, in this section of the United States. But what's not in agreement between the models is what's coming here, this kind of tropical pulse of moisture that's going to be coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, hitting parts of you know Alabama and Georgia. You see the European model had more precipitation here than the GFS. So again, here's the GFS. This is the European. So we're going to watch for these differences and try to understand what's going on. But since we're talking about the tropics, I would like to keep you up to date on what we're watching. National Hurricane Center in that embedded graphic down there is giving a 90% chance of development uh, of a tropical disturbance that's out here in the open Atlantic. Uh, if it does develop, it will become Tropical Storm or Hurricane Epsilon. But right now, due to the deeper troughs that keep cutting through the central part of the United States, the highest probability is for this particular system to stay away from shore. They're also watching another area down here coming out of the um, Caribbean. And I want to watch that as well because there's been some evidence over the weekend that we could take some of that moisture and then run it up here along the East Coast, which is part of the reason why the European model was drawing more moisture into the Southeast uh, than uh, when compared to the, um, to, to the GFS. But from there, I would like to give you some broader scale information about what's going on in the tropics and take you over to where the MJO is centered right now. See, for the last about 40 days, the MGO has been stuck right here in phase four and five, but recently it's come out deeper into phase five and is forecast to cut back across six and seven. Now that means that we're going to start to see better upper level support right through this area centered on 60 degrees uh, west, which is over the Caribbean, which is over the Gulf of Mexico and the Western Atlantic, and also over South America, which is going to help with the monsoonal flow there. And you're about to see some big rains coming through that area. I'll talk about that at the end of this video. But overall, you can see that this is going to be the corridor over which we're going to see developing over the next 10 to 15 days better upper level support for the development of, of precipitation. And when we're talking about the tropics, that does mean uh, some late season tropical developments. We'll keep a close eye on that. Now, as we look early this morning, coming to back here to the United States, we can see the effects of that frontal boundary still pushing through parts of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. We've had some steady rainfall overnight in through this corridor. But taking it from here and looking forward into this forecast, I want you to pay attention to what this upper level pattern is doing because it's still relatively blocked up in the midsection of the country where that deep trough is currently sitting. Now, what's going to keep it here is the fact we keep building ridges into the Gulf of Alaska. But I want you to see these subtle features features as they change throughout this week. So notice as we play through the middle of this week, here's Monday, getting into Tuesday and Wednesday, we're going to continue to see uh, pieces on the backside of this broader trough, little short waves that come sneaking through. So for example, this one cutting through parts of the Pacific Northwest uh, on, on Wednesday. Well, watch as that one just gets flung right here by the time we get out toward you know th th uh, Thursday, then eventually into Friday into the Central Plains. This is going to be bringing in a big surge of warmth ahead of it with a lot of cold air on the backside. I'll show you that in a few moments. As we then work our way through the day on Friday, I'm going to watch all week long to see if this develops on Friday into Saturday morning. That's another trough that comes in out of the north through the Columbia Basin, which means we'd be pushing snow onto the eastern facing slopes of the Cascades and cutting it right through parts of the northern Rockies. But notice by the time I get out to this weekend, our ridge is still firmly in place here in the Gulf of Alaska. And that particular trough as it cuts through over the weekend gets here by the time I get you to basically Sunday night. Now you know this, if there's a trough sitting in through this area, we'll have good upper level support right in through here for rising motion and the potential uh, for precipitation. So let's get in and talk about that. 
to begin with. Running across the top, I have today, that's Monday in the upper left, Tuesday in the top center, and Wednesday in the upper right, looking at where we do have the threat for some thunderstorms. And as we look at the high resolution NAM model, this gets us through early this morning. We can see those snow showers still spreading through this section here uh, of the country, but out ahead of it where the main frontal boundary is, we are going to be watching out. You might hear a rumble of thunder in through here, but more than likely, this is just going to be widespread uh, scattered showers. As we let this play going from Monday afternoon into the evening hours and then eventually into tomorrow morning, once again, we're going to be watching for scattered snow showers right through parts of North Dakota. Our frontal boundary is still lingering right in through here, keeping much of our southeast and mid-Atlantic dry as we work our way through Tuesday. We do notice that by Tuesday evening, the snow does spread into parts of, uh, gets out of North Dakota, spreads into parts of um, uh, Minnesota and northern Wisconsin. And then as we work our way toward the middle of this week, we're about to see a bit of a rebound as that system pulls through the Great Lakes. We're going to see a shift in the winds coming out of the south. And I want to show you what that's going to do. Because by Thursday afternoon, we could see the recovery of low level instability and also good moisture transport. And that could give us the risk of thunderstorms right here as this next system develops by the middle and end of this week. So we're gonna keep out an outlook here for some thunderstorms coming through Iowa after the snow over the weekend and early this week. So to see that, I wanna play for the European model. And we've already looked out through the next 60 hours. So I'm gonna pause it right here. This is now Wednesday morning. As we go from Wednesday morning, into Wednesday afternoon and evening. This is gonna be where we're gonna to start to watch our next system develop. Now you can see the isobars, those are the lines there. They're gonna tell you those strong winds we're expecting midweek this week. But this is now Wednesday evening, working our way into Thursday, this is Thursday afternoon and evening. Now, what I'm going to be watching carefully is major rebound in temperatures on some very strong southerly winds. Look at how tightly packed these isobars are. And so as this frontal boundary slips right in through this area, that's going to be the region of concern for the strong to severe storms, maybe even later this week. But you can tell there's quite a bit of cold air on the back side of this because by Thursday night, working our way into the overnight hours and Friday morning, as that front presses right here from parts of the Great Lakes through Illinois, Missouri, back into Oklahoma, where we're going to be seeing ch chances for some thunderstorms here, uh, but also some locally heavy rainfall. There's going to be some cold air on the back side of this shooting through. Now, as we continue to play that forward, you also see the systems I was talking about here in the Pacific Northwest. This is now Friday night. That second trough that kicks through there uh, is going to be problematic for parts of the Columbia Basin. But out ahead of it, some really cold air in place. And that's why over the weekend, this is now getting out towards Saturday afternoon. Saturday evening and now next Sunday we're going to watch again for the high plains and the northern plains to have yet more chances of snow in this area and with these winds in through here some of this could really get whipping around. Meanwhile, this weekend, we could also see some sh uh, scattered showers and storms from, from Virginia all the way down to parts of Alabama as well. So there was a lot of things going on here, but let's just take again a look at what we're expecting in terms of that snowfall. So I'm going to play this forward for you walking through this week. Let's pause it right there through system number one. So here is what we're expecting. There's that scattered snow that could move through today through parts of Iowa. Then as the next system rolls through, we're going to watch this part of Minnesota. As you can see, going right across Minneapolis here with the chance of snow into northern Wisconsin. But as we play this on through past Wednesday, now getting into Thursday, and look at that snow spart starting to spread here through parts of the northern plains as we get through Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Now, when you start to look at these snow maps, because this is just a single model run, you're like, wow, that's quite a bit going through here. Let's step back and take a more reasonable look at this by just trying to get the probability of grabbing at least three inches of snow. So this is through next Sunday, probability from the European model at getting three inches of snowfall. So that's that corridor I mentioned to you right in through here. And there it is once again, looking at the GFS model. So both models picking up on this area as having the potential for picking up quite a bit of snow throughout this week. We'll provide details in our regional content. As I get out then to uh, day seven, remember our trough is going to be sitting right in through here with the ridge in the Gulf of Alaska. So as that sweeps through, that area is going to have the best, best upper level support. And we can see that into week two, this is going to be the region we're going to watch most carefully for having the increased chances of precipitation as we finish out October and start to get into the month of November. 
From there, by day 10, you can see that the ridge is going to start to rebuild into the west. Both models are kind of hinting at that, with the GFS being the slower at kicking out this trough. Uh, but the question is, what's that going to be doing to our temperatures? So let's get into that part of this discussion. Here is Monday's high temperatures compared to normal. So behind that front, still quite cool. But look at the rebound of warmth west. Now watch this temperature pattern evolve. Ready? It's almost going to go into reset mode. Here's Monday. As we go into Tuesday, it almost appears that from Tuesday into Wednesday, the cold air is retreating, right? So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. What's going on here is we're starting to see the resurgence of that warmth coming back out ahead of this. And as we get into Thursday, look at the warm up we're going to be seeing here uh, behind this warm front stretching from Texas all the way into parts of like Pennsylvania, getting up into the northeast. But there's going to be a sharp frontal boundary through here. And that's why we're going to be in the lookout for some stronger thunderstorm potential right in through there. But as you can imagine, that front's going to move. So from Thursday into Friday, and Saturday, the next big surge of some colder air comes in. And we're going to be seeing temperatures here where that snow is expected to fall, really get down there into the 20s for high temperatures coming into parts of the northern and high plains. So that gets you through Saturday. What about that 6 to 10 day forecast? Well, both models agree that the uh, cold air anchor is going to be sitting right in through here. And uh, while it's going to be warm over parts of the southeast, as you can see in both models here, the deeper trough as it comes curling around there in the uh, central plains of North America are going to keep things cold. The pattern does progress, though. We could start to see some of this warmth really beginning to spread out of the west back into the central United States. But we're probably getting some uh, feedback here from the snowpack, which is where the models are trying to keep the temperatures much cooler than average there in the Dakotas, really in the Red River Valley uh, of the north. From here, what I'd like to finish up with is a bit of a discussion on South America. Our last 45 days, as we all have been discussing, has been very dry throughout Brazil's main growing area. I'd like to explain to you why. It's been a weak monsoon. If you look over here on the left for the month of October, we tend to get quite a bit of moisture transport coming from two areas as the monsoon becomes established. These are just winds in the low levels of the atmosphere. What we've had has been very stagnant flow. Can you see it there? And that's what's really kept uh, the monsoon from re-engaging uh, through parts of Brazil. But here's the thing. Over the next week, we are going to start to see much better precipitation on that moisture transport getting in here. So we got about five days of drier conditions before this really heavy rain starts to come back in. We're talking about one to two inches that's going to cut right through this part of Brazil into Mato Grosso. From there into week two, we see the pattern continuing to stay wet. So what we had before was too dry to plant. Now we're going to have such heavy precipitation, this is also going to hinder planting progress because we're going to have to be dodging these storms as they come through. So it's not as though we're going to start making rapid progress on planting anytime soon. Now, what I want to finish with is this La Nina. You see, our La Nina is really robust and our ocean temperatures are now down there, almost approaching one and a half degrees Celsius below average. So this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And using the trajectory of this La Nina, we talked about in last week's long range update that we've identified some analog years here. Interestingly enough, for September and October, it tended to be also dry in these analog years in this area. But what I'm talking about here is using those same analog years, looking at December through February, it was drier here in Brazil and also drier in Argentina with a wet corridor right in between. Now, why I bring that up is because I want to remind you the long range forecast for December, January and February for South America follows the analog years quite well, as you can see here. So we have a developing story coming out of South America that is uh, needing our attention as we progress forward uh, through northern hemisphere fall and winter and southern hemisphere spring and summer. We'll keep you up to date. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week.